Mona Parker. Um, so she's bringing the word tonight. I called her at four and, and said, what are you teaching on? And she told me, and then she said, you want to teach with me? And I'm like, mom, it's like four o'clock. I mean, I'll stand up there with you and like cheer for you or something. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stand up here and just cheer her on. And, you know, if I have anything to say, I'll chime in. But sometimes it's just fun. Uh, how many of you watched uh, wrestling growing up? Tag team, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Give it. There. Give you my Randy Macho Man Savage. That was back in the good old days of wrestling right there, right? Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff flying. We, you better start right now or things are going to get out of hand. Okay. We're going to have a wrestling match yeah. in the sanctuary. Let's do it. Hey, I'm impressed. Um, we've got a pretty good crowd here on, on spring breaking. I, I said something to Landon. I said, I do believe that everybody, uh, most everybody is out of the country on spring break. When I was a kid, spring break was, I don't go to school that week. I, I, I didn't think about leaving the country and, and going on vacation or anything, but hey, that, that's uh, pretty cool. What would you say, Kylie? Oh, same, yeah. Uh, so anyway, Pastors Nate and Evan, they are in Minnesota and will be there through Thursday. They are going to a prayer conference, and so we want to pray and believe that there's going to be divine impartation. Uh, in their lives, for them personally, uh, for them as a family, and then for us and for our church family. Amen. That what is imparted to them, they're going to come back, uh, and there's going to be not just information, but impartation from the Spirit of God. Amen. Uh, so let's pray before we get into the Word. And so, Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your precious spirit, the spirit of truth, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation that is here in this house tonight, eager to flood the eyes of our heart with light. Father, we lift up Pastors Nate and Evan to you as they are sitting under uh, your word at, at this prayer conference. Father, and we're asking you for divine impartations by the Spirit of God uh, that, that their hearts would be flooded with light and it would be a word uh, in due season in this day and in this hour, not only for them but for this house equipping for this house and for this people that we would walk in the fullness of the plan of God for our lives. Hallelujah. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it. We thank you that your word is anointed and as we as we share your word tonight, that your word goes into our hearts and it does a work. It brings life where there is death. Glory to God. Glory to God. So we thank you, Lord, right now. We just lift our hands to you again, and we say thank you for answers tonight. Thank you for life, Lord. Thank you for your life-giving word, your life-flowing blood. Thank you for the truth of your word that we do overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And our testimony is, thus saith the Lord. Hallelujah. It is written. It is written. Glory to God. And so we give you honor and we give you praise and we thank you that in this house that there's a step up, that there's a coming up, that there is a coming up. Hallelujah. There's a coming up in the things of God. There's a coming up and there's a going over. There's a coming up and there's a going over in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, you just jump in anytime. It's all good. I, I got notes, but. Uh, that is against the rules. You have to tag out when you want that, right? So you're going to hit me when you're ready to talk? No. I'll just jump in. We'll break Yeah, I'll just rules. jump in. Because you know I may not quit talking. Right, yeah, which is why I wonder why I'm up here. But. We'll, <laughs> We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you've got your Bibles, and I pray that you do, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, all right? Uh, get in a habit. Uh, be in the habit of bringing God's life-giving word with you to church. 
Amen. Amen. Get in the habit of having his word with you. There is nothing like, I'm just telling you, you guys, we can sit and we can listen, but there's nothing like our eyes seeing for ourselves the word of God. Amen. There, there, there's no substitute for it. it, and it is. It's hugely, hugely important. All right, 1 Corinthians 2, and we're going to start in verse 2. Uh, I'm going to read the first verse out of the Amplified, then I'm going to go uh, to King James. It says, this is the Apostle Paul talking and uh, talking to the people uh, in Corinthians, uh, or the Corinthian people, and he said, For I resolved to know nothing to be acquainted with nothing, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing, and to be conscious of nothing among you except Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and him crucified. Mm. I'm determined. I am determined to know, to I, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Crucified. I wanted to read that verse in the Amplified because it said uh, to be acquainted with nothing, to know nothing, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing. How many of you know uh, that knowledge in the last days is on the rise? <clears throat> is that right? Human wisdom. Human wisdom. Don't start this. In the name of Jesus. I drank out of that. <laughs> Here. Here. Also, y'all didn't see, but I didn't have anywhere to put my gum, so it's right there. <laughs> he knows how much I love that. <laughs> oh, my word. <sighs> see how many Tag. more drinks she gets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, human wisdom knowledge, intellect. And I'm telling you, you guys, uh, if we waste our time on anything, like the Apostle Paul said, anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified, we are uh, wasting our time. We are feeding on the wrong thing. No matter, no matter how... <clears throat> You know, there's some cool things out there to, to talk about and, and, and to listen to. But if I'm not listening to the things that points me to the, to the cross, uh, to his burial, to his death, to his resurrection, and, it's feeding my, and if it's not feeding my faith to equip me to run my race in victory all the way to the finish line, uh, then what I'm feeding on is in vain. It's not going to equip me. It's not going to empower me. Amen. Amen. Um, so verse 3, he says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Say, of the Spirit, of the Spirit. and of power. Underline those two words, of the spirit, I know that's three words, but spirit and power, that your faith, thank you, honey, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Don't you want your faith to stand in the power of God and not the intellectual reasoning of men? Amen. Amen. That your faith. Faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's uh, go down to verse 12, and it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Do y'all know that? That if you are born again, you have received the spirit of Almighty God. You are the temple of Almighty God. Amen. So we haven't received the spirit of the world, but we have received the spirit of God. 
that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. I'm so sorry. Mute me for just a second. Probably should have tagged me before that. I could have covered that up. I love where she's at here, though, and um, I just pulled this up in the Passion. Sometimes I'll read out of that. I know it's, a, it's more of a newer translation, but a lot of the words, they, they go back to the original language that I like. And in verse 12, it says, We didn't receive the spirit of this world system, but the spirit of God, so that we might come to understand and experience all that grace has lavished upon us. And we articulate these realities with the words imparted to us by the spirit and not with the words taught by human wisdom. We join together spirit-revealed truths with spirit-revealed words. So this is how we articulate these realities. What does it say? How do we articulate these realities? With our words. With our words. Amen. Amen. So good. In that verse, uh, at verse 12 there, it talks about that we might know. We've received the Spirit of God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Amen. We're not going to learn these things. We're not going to catch it head first. We're going to catch it from the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, revealing to us the things that have been freely given to us by God. Amen. And we know uh, in John it tells us that uh, his words are spirit and life. Is that right? His words are spirit and life. So we are the spirit of God on the inside of us is going to illuminate revelation of his word because his word tells us who we are in Christ and the things that have been freely given to us. If we don't have his word in us, the Holy Spirit is limited in what he can reveal to us. Amen. So, how many of you know that God designed us to reign in life? Do you know that? There's a few that do, and there's a few that may not be convinced that you were created to dominate. To not be dominated, but to dominate. God created us to reign in life. Amen? Let's turn to Romans 5.17. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you. I think if I could just spit a you-know-what, it would help. Sorry, this has got to go. Let's pray. (laughs) Sorry about that. All right, Romans 5 17. For if by one man's offense, who was that one man? man. Adam. Adam. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign. In life, by one, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, We are to be reigning in life. We are to be reigning in life. And God has done everything. He's perfectly done his part so that we would dominate, that we would not be dominated by the kingdom of darkness, that we would not be ruled by the kingdom of darkness, but that we would be the ones that dominate the kingdom of darkness. Come on now. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So, you know, ask yourself this question. Are, am I receiving abundance of grace? Am I receiving abundance of grace? Second Corinthians 8, 9 uh, tells us that he has caused. He has caused all grace to abound unto us 
causing us to have all sufficiency in all things and abounding unto every good work. Does that sound like reigning in life? Does that sound like dominating? So all grace, all grace abounds unto us. We're living in the age of where the favor of God and the, the free favors of God and the grace of God profusely abounds. So we, by faith, tap into that grace. It's not going to fall on us. It's not going to fall on you like a ripe cherry from a tree. You're going to tap into it. I'm going to tap into it by taking God at, God at his word and receiving it. Yes, amen. Uh, I want to read Revelations 1, 5, and 6. In the King James, it, it reads like this. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Glory to God. Your sins are not covered. They are washed away. Jesus, gone. Jesus took them from us, removed them from us as far as the east is from the west. Hallelujah. By his blood. By his blood that was shed for us at Calvary. Our sins washed away in his own blood. Verse 6, And he's made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He's made us to be kings. It sounds like to me, uh, he's made us kings and we are to be reigning. Is that right? Have you ever seen a king that is... Uh, uh, underneath that, that, you know, that he's being dominated instead of dominating? Never. No, that's right. Never. He's made us to be kings. Say, I am supposed to, am supposed to dominate. dominate. Amen. So how do kings reign? Let me ask you this. We're going to talk more about it. How do kings reign? How do they make law and keep order in their kingdom? That's right. By their words. Is that right? They, they make a decree, and it is law. It is what is carried out. Is that right? The same is true with us. How do, how do we reign in life by Christ Jesus? By taking his thoughts, by taking his word, making them our words, amen, and decreeing them so in our lives. Amen. So let's talk about authority and dominion. If you'll turn to uh, Psalms 8. Wow, we don't have much time. All right, we're going to start in uh, verse 3. And this is an account, uh, Hebrews chapter 2 tells us, this is an account of an angel. Uh, of an angel talking to God. And, and the angel said, When I view and consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained and established, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? In the King James says, the son of man that you visit him. The angel is saying, what is man? Uh, before man was created, they had never seen a creation like this before, like, like mankind. And we know that in Genesis 1, it tells us that God said, let us make man in whose image? In, that's right, in our image, in their image. He, <coughs> excuse me, he created man. And do you know that we are the only species of being that's in God's class? Amen. Amen. We are made in His image. We're not angels. And, and you know, people say, uh, well, so-and-so got, uh, got their wings. They, <clears throat> they moved to heaven. They've died. They've passed away. They got their wings. Becoming an angel when you die would be a demotion. That's right. Man is made in God's image. Say, I'm made in God's image. Verse 5 says, Yet you have made him uh, but a little lower than, uh, in the King James it says angels, 
That word in the Hebrew is not angels. <clears throat> Excuse me. That word is Elohim, which is the name of God. You have made him a little lower than Elohim. You've made him a little lower than yourself. I love Billy Brim. I, I have to bring this up nearly every time that I, that I say this verse. But her explanation of this when she, she was talking about the creation of man and what a big, huge deal it was uh, in that point of eternity. And angels were just in awe. What is man? What is this man that you've made him just a little lower than yourself? You know, in heaven, there's rank and order. Is that right? With God, there's rank and order. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There are archangels, and then there are ranks of angels underneath them. Is that right? And the angel's looking at this creation of man, and, the, and one angel says, I didn't even know that position was open. That there would be this being that is created just a little lower than God himself. Amen. Amen. This is Bible. It makes religious spirits mad. It makes religious spirits mad for us to read the Bible and read the truth of who we are, who God made man to be. Satan's ticked off, and you, knew, you know why? Because he, he wanted to be God. God just opened his mouth and handled him. Right? But then his target were the ones who was created in God's image to rule and to reign. So Satan wanted to be you. He wants your dominion. He wants your authority. Amen. So we need to know this. We need to know how God made us to be, to dominate and not be dominated. Yeah, this, is, this becomes hugely important. So, uh, I mean, you guys may have heard this before. I've heard this, I've heard this teaching before. This, this is what we call spiritual re realities. This is what we call in Christ realities. This is who we are in Christ. This is who God has made us to be. And I think that we go on believing lies about ourselves, about who we are, and you're, you cannot properly use the authority that God has given you when you believe a lie about yourself and you're not convinced of who you are in Christ. Right. You can't do it. You have right. to believe what the Bible says where there are angels who said, what, what is this man that you're so mindful of him? God, God made you and formed you in his very own image That's right. to act just like him. And if that wasn't enough, his own son, Jesus, became a man, and he will be man forever. Mm -hmm. He's the God-man. Mm -hmm. And that's the class that we're in. That's right. And you see how Jesus right. operated on the earth. You know how he used his authority on the earth. He spoke his word. Right. This is how he did it. That's right. And we cannot go on believing a lie, any lie that the enemy would try to tell you about who you are or mainly who you're not. Who you're not because of what you've done or because what you haven't done to this point. Because when I believe a lie, I empower the liar in my life. Mm -hmm. And what, what, uh, what happens also when I believe a lie, I have to have other lies to support that lie that I already believe. Mm. So lies just continue to stack up in my life when I don't believe and know who I am in Christ. Yeah. It's like when I asked my, my daughter, did you brush your teeth? Yeah. What kind of, and she didn't. What kind of toothpaste did you use? Uh, th th this kind. There's a second lie. Mm -hmm. Well, is your toothbrush even in your bathroom? I thought it was in my bathroom. Yeah. There's a third. So she's having to lie to support the original lie. So this is why we must, we must, when we uh, have a thought come that doesn't originate from God's word about who we are and our identity, we must address it right then. That's right. Just as important as addressing it, we must replace it with truth. That's right. You have to have the truth to replace it right then. That's right. Because if I don't That's replace right. that with truth, I'm, I'm continuing to let this lie linger. And what, what happens is when the Bible talks about strongholds, uh, you know, it's like um, uh, you think about the wall of Jericho or how, or how things used to be made. It was just stone by stone by stone, right? 
and before long you had a stronghold. You can't enter. But one stone isn't a stronghold. But if I just let that keep going and building, now there's a stronghold, right? And it's because I believed one lie. We must replace any lie about who we're not right. or about um, just who we're, you know, who the enemy comes to try to tell us that we are, that right. we don't measure up. Man, we, we have got to, on our worst days, we have got to be able to open our mouths and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's right. That's right. Who we are in him. And I may be getting ahead of where you're going. I guess we're talking about authority now. But th this is very important. Uh, we, we don't maybe talk about this as much, talking about being kings and priests and royalty and things like that. That's not really part of the culture that we grew up in. We're in America. This is a democracy. We're not ruled by a king. But in, in the kingdom of God, that kind of says it all. It's a kingdom. Kingdom. Ruled by a king. Right? That's right. It's a kingdom thing. That's and right. so things work by the word that the king releases. And we are, mm. this is something that Pastor Nate has been saying a lot, we are his representatives, his delegates here on the earth. Mm -hmm. We're to operate just like he does. Mm -hmm. That's right. So while we talk about the importance of words, and yeah, words are important, and, and life and death are in the power of your tongue, yes, 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 and yes, and it's because of this right here, the authority that God has given to you cannot be exercised without your word. That's right. And it can't be exercised if you're believing a lie. That's right. That's right. Amen. And so continuing in, in verse 8, that the, the um, not verse 8, chapter 8, it said, You've made him but a little lower than Elohim, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Say, I've been crowned, I've been crowned. by God, by God. With, glory with glory and honor. And you remember the story of Moses when Moses was beseeching God. He said, show me your glory. And, and what God did, uh, because all of God's glory would have consumed and kill Mo killed Moses. Uh, that, side, that side of the cross, right? And it says that God took him and put him in the cleft of a rock. What's that a picture of? God took him and he put him in Jesus. He put him in Christ. And he said, now I'm going to pass by you and I'm going to show you my goodness. Moses asked to see the glory of God. God said, I'm going to show you all of my goodness. God crowned you with goodness. God crowned you with goodness, with glory and with honor. And baby, we ain't been honored until God honors us. And he crowned us with that. Sorry for the spit. He crowned us with glory and with honor. Verse 6, you made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. He created you to have dominion. Amen. Say, God made me to dominate. Not to be dominated. Now, we don't dominate other people. Right? But we do dominate uh, the enemy. We're going to talk about that here right now. So we know that this is how God created us. And we know that man fell. Landon talked about this. Adam bowed his knee to Satan in the garden. Is that right? That's right. He bowed his knee to Satan in the garden, this is where our authority and our dominion was transferred. People say, why does God allow bad things to happen? God doesn't allow bad things to happen. Man turned his authority and his dominion over to the enemy of our souls in the garden. And this is how he did it, by taking Satan's word over God's word. He believed a lie. By taking Satan's word over God's word, Adam and Eve handed their authority and their dominion over to Satan, and Satan became the God, the little G God of this world. That's why bad things happen in this world. Amen. Amen. 
And, uh, and in doing that, they threw all of mankind into Satan's kingdom where sin and death reigned. Amen. Amen. So instead of man having dominion and ruling and reigning, now sin reigned. Now death reigned. Now sickness and disease reigned. Now poverty and lack reigned. Now depression reigned. Now lack and poverty reigned. Amen. Amen. So, so when Adam and Eve fell, then we became prisoners. We became dominated by Satan and his kingdom. Sin dominated us. Sin dominated us. We were completely separated from the kingdom of God and from the life of God. That was the condition of man. That was your condition. That was your condition before you made Jesus your Lord. Amen. Say, but God. But God. Like Landon said well ago, he came as man. He became our substitute. And he defeated Satan as a man. This is important. He had already defeated Satan as God when he kicked him out of heaven. Right? Right? He, defeat, he became our substitute and he defeated Satan as a man. Filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit. Oh, I mean, that is so good. He whooped him as a man. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. This is the voice translation. He said, He eliminated the massive debt that we incurred by the law that stood against us. How many of you know, uh, according to the law, we were guilty? We're, we were. We were guilty. He, uh, he said, He eliminated the debt uh, that stood against us. He took it all away. He nailed it to the cross, but that's not all. He nailed it to the cross. So when Jesus was nailed to the cross, we were nailed to the cross. We were in Christ, amen, and our old man, our old sin nature, that one who bowed uh, our knee to the lordship of Satan, that sin nature was crucified with Jesus. Come on now. <clears throat> but that's not all. He disarmed those who once ruled over us, those who had, in, uh, who had overpowered us, like captives of war. He put them on display to the world to show his victory over them by means of the cross. Have, amen. Have y'all ever read that in Colossians? What did I say it was? Colossians 2, right? And, uh, and so when he went to hell, how many of you know Jesus went to hell? For the wages of sin is death. And he took all of our sins upon him. And the Lord Jesus Christ, as a man, died spiritually. He was never, he had never been separated from God the Father. Never separated until he bore our sins. And he went to hell and he paid the price for our sins. Amen. And it says, though, that he defeated Satan in his own territory. Death could not hold him. He went and got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And let me tell you, he already had it as God. He did this as man, as our substitute for you and for me. Amen. 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 <clears throat> went to hell, took the, the keys of death, hell, and the grave, Glory to God. Glory to God. His victory is our victory. Amen. Amen. Colossians 1, 12 through 13. Oh my gosh, I love this. Uh, I thought I'd written it down, but I didn't. Colossians, I do want to read it. Colossians 1, 12. says, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet or fit or able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light who has delivered us from the power, that word power is actually authority, who has delivered us from the authority of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Glory to God. 
So we have been delivered from that kingdom of darkness. We've been delivered from uh, the kingdom where death reigns. We've been delivered from that kingdom where sickness and disease reigns. We've been delivered from that kingdom where lack and poverty and depression and hopelessness reigns. Now the keys of death, hell, and the grave have been given to us, the authority and the dominion, and we are the ones that are to dominate that kingdom in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Um, I was going to go to Ephesians. You have? Go ahead. Great. That's a great book. Go it there. It's a great book. Ephesians 1, my goodness, guys, these are the things that we must be feeding on. This is, this is so much better than any TV you're ever going to watch. This is, so, this is so much better than any game you're going to watch, any game that you're going to play. And uh, we want to be equipped, don't we? Yeah. Don't you want to dominate? Aren't you sick and tired of being dominated? by the things that you are supposed to be dominating in your life. Sometimes we got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Sometimes we've got to get fed up. And the lie of the enemy is that we're waiting and we're waiting on God to do something and we're waiting on God to do something and we're waiting on God to do something when the truth of the matter is we're content with putting up with it. Yeah. Amen. Ephesians 1 we're going to start in 16. It says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. This is a prayer uh, that would benefit us to pray every single day. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. God wants us to know some things. Aren't you glad? And he said, and it's revealed to us by the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The spirit of God that will illuminate these things unto us. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened so that we can know and understand the hope to which we have been called. And what are the riches of, of his glory uh, in his inheritance in the saints? In verse 19 it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? The greatness of his power is to usward. Say, the greatness of his power is to me. And then those next two words, who believe. Who believe, Amen? Amen. So we need the spirit of revel, uh, the spirit of wisdom and revelation to flood the eyes of our heart with light, so that we can know and understand the things that have been freely given to us by God, who He created us to be as people with uh, rule and dominion and authority, and walking in it, and walking in it, Amen. <clears throat> And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? I love the way it reads in the Amplified. So that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe. Does this sound like people uh, who should be defeated in life? It, sh it sounds like people who should be dominating. Is that right? If the exceeding greatness of his power is to us word who believe, that power is to dominate. That power is to dominate the kingdom of darkness in your life. Amen. Amen. I'm going to jump down in chapter 2 and we're going to read uh, verse uh, 5 here. Well, verse 4, the first couple of verses in verse 2 talks about our condition that we were in the world without God. Um, and then in verse 4 in the Amplified, it says, But God, so rich is he in his mercy because of, and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us. Uh, verse 5, it says, Even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ. 
By grace are you saved. And he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. I'm sorry, I left y'all hanging in in verse 1. Sorry, Landon. Um, I'm going to back up for a minute. Slow down, Mona. We're going to go back to chapter 1. And we talked about uh, the exceeding greatness of his power to usward. Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he's put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Go down in chapter 2 and verse 6, and it says, And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When the head was raised, the body was raised. We are one with Christ. Amen? So he didn't just raise the head. The body went with him. Glory to God. So we were crucified with Christ. We were buried with Christ. We were raised with Christ. Amen? And it said that God seated him at his own right hand. That is the supreme position of all power in the universe. The right, listen, the right hand of God. This is where God raised Jesus and his body to. We share the very same seat of authority that the Lord Jesus Christ sits in. The very same, the very same, we are one with him. Jesus' head is not separate from his body. When he was raised, we were raised. And we sit in that very same seat of authority with all things under our feet, far above, All principality, all power, and all dominion. Amen. Amen. Now then, it's not enough for us to know this. We've got to know it. We have to feed on it. We have to rehearse it. But we have to enforce it. We have to enforce our authority. It, It... we, we can't just walk around with, with the nice thought, with the nice thought that we do have authority because it's not going to do us any good if we're not exercising our authority. Amen? And how do we exercise our authority? With our words. That's exactly right. Yeah. Go ahead. And I haven't fully fleshed this out here, but I'm just thinking. So just think through this with me about us being the body of Christ. He's the head. And... In a body, uh, my fingers, I'm moving my fingers right now because my head is telling them to do this, right? Mm-hmm. If, if, there were, if there was no connection between my fingers and my head, the head could be saying move, but my fingers couldn't do it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, and so it is with our authority, too. I, my, my fingers can't just do whatever they want to do That's right. apart from the head. They, That's right. They're, they're useless without the head. That's right. And so in order for my fingers to have function and do what they're supposed to do, they have to respond and they have to do what the head says to do. That's right. So it's, we use our authority not by, not by my fingers can't make up, my fingers can't think on their own. My fingers function because of what the head tells them to do. I, my only function in the body of Christ, I only work and my authority only works when I say what the head says. When I respond to the head, and I do right. what the head says. That's right? right. And I love this. This is what uh, last time we were together, last Wednesday, Pastor Evan taught Thank a message Lord. called Words Are Enough. And mm-hmm. she mentioned, uh, I remember back in the, uh, when we were doing some of our services online a few years ago, uh, just talking about authority. And this came up again last week. And you remember there, there's a couple of accounts of this in the gospel where there was a Roman officer who had a servant, right, who was sick. And he sent people to Jesus. 
and, uh, and th- this was a good man. The, the religious leader said, Jesus, this is a good man. If anyone ever deserved to be healed, it's him. Uh, it's his servant. He, like, he's, he's built this for us. He's done this for us, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. They approached Jesus based, based on what the guy did, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, and let's see how this story plays out because this is re- very important right here. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of this, Jesus says, one of the only two times in the gospels Jesus ever said this, this is this right here, this type of faith, this is the greatest faith I've experienced even in all of Israel mm-hmm. right here. Mm-hmm. And I want to I want to turn there real quick. We don't have this scripture, but I'm going to read out of Luke chapter seven, and I'm going to read uh, start in. We'll just start in verse one. It says Luke seven one. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, he turned to Capernaum. At the time a highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does. They said he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them. Jesus went with them. Mm-hmm. But just before they arrived at the house, mm-hmm. the officer sent some mm-hmm. friends to, to, to say, Lord, mm-hmm. so it's not, this isn't the Roman officer going. He's sending delegates to mm-hmm. go. Mm-hmm. He's I, saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home, for I'm not worthy of such an honor. I'm not even worthy to come and meet you. Right. He said, just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. Man. And he said, I know this. Because I'm under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go when they go, or come when they come, and I can say to my slaves, do this, and they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, turning to the crowd that was following him. He said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Mm. And what, what, was, what is this faith that Jesus is talking about? The guy said, Jesus, uh, you don't need to come to my home, I, because I understand how authority works. What Jesus said was great faith was someone understanding how authority works. This is great faith. Mm-hmm. This is what great faith looks like. Mm-hmm. Me understanding how authority works. Mm-hmm. Just say the word from where you're at, mm-hmm. and what you say will happen because of the authority that you carry. Mm-hmm. Now, who are we? We are the body of Christ. We are Jesus in the earth. Mm-hmm. We are to say what Jesus says, and we are to expect the results that Jesus would get. That's right. That's right. This is great faith. That's right. And what stood out to me in this passage as well when I read it, uh, the centurion wasn't wasn't a Jew. He he wasn't in the covenant of God at, at that time that the Jewish people had. He was not a covenant man. The covenant people... Uh, that came to Jesus to ask him to come heal the centurion's servant, they approached Jesus with this, if anyone deserves to be healed, this man deserves to be healed because he has, with his own money, built this temple for us. That is what the covenant people were saying. That's what religious spirits say. Uh, It's like, well... Oh, God, if anybody, if anybody deserves to be healed, it's Aunt Sally. Aunt Sally is always serving in the church. She's always going and visiting the sick. Aunt Sally does this and Aunt Sally does that. Lord, she deserves to be healed. That's what religion says. Amen. Ain't nobody deserves a healing. We don't earn healing by our good works. And yet someone who didn't even have a covenant with God at the time stepped out of that time in eternity, put himself in a place of faith and said, all I need is for you to say the word and my servant will be healed. So we, we, we must not lose ourselves in what we think we deserve and what we don't deserve because we won't be receiving anything from God. Because what comes from God into your life is by grace. Because he's good, not because you're good. And we lay hold of all that he's done for us by faith. So don't be going to God and telling him and giving him your resume on why you think that you deserve this. Just say, Father, I come and I, t- and I receive what you have so graciously given unto me. I receive it by faith and I say, thank you, Lord. That's it. 
Hallelujah. And this is the confidence that we have to start <laughs> having when we're when we're speaking God's word. When when we're maybe dealing with someone and maybe they're going through something, we we can use the God-given authority that we have and speak God's word and declare God's word over them. It's saying this same thing. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. And he said, "I know this. I know this because I'm under authority." That's it. I know that God's word will work. I know that your word will work. You already said, Jesus said, I'm coming. So guess he just had to know that Jesus would come and that he's willing. Since he knew that he was willing, he knew that his word would work. And he said, I know this because I'm under authority. That's right. I'm under authority. If we're under his authority, we can say this to people. I know this will work because I'm under the authority of God. That's right. I'm under his authority. I'm just going to say his word and it will work. I don't have the pressure to perform anything. No. He is the performer of his own word. That's right. I just say the word from where I'm at and expect God to do what he said he would do. That's right. Amen. Amen. I'm going to throw this out there because it's in my notes and it's exactly what he's been saying for the last few minutes. To exercise our rightful place of authority and dominion over the kingdom of darkness, we must do two things. And number one is our memory verse from a few weeks ago, James 4, 7. We must be submitted to God because that's where our dominion comes from. Our dominion and our authority comes from him. Amen. And so just like he was saying, uh, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Doesn't that sound like dominion and authority? Resist the devil, and he will flee. Uh, I believe many times, many times we try to resist the devil. We try to resist sickness. We try to resist poverty. We try to resist lack. We try to resist depression. But the problem is we're not submitted to God. And in order for our authority and our dominion to work, just like he was saying, we must be submitted to God. What does that look like? We must be submitted to his word. If we, if we don't know what his word says, we're not coming under the authority of God. Amen. 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 So we submit ourselves unto God. We submit ourselves to His Word. We submit ourselves to His plan. Amen. Amen. And, we, and we must, that is where our dominion and our authority flows from. Right? Right? And I don't know if you're going to get a finish what you have there. Probably yeah. not. So no, we're done. maybe I'll wrap up with this right here just to put this. <clears throat> this is why these things are important. These weekly memory verses and us reading the word and everything. I mean, I think this was last night or two nights ago. Um, uh, one of my kids, the, you know, they got caught lying about something. Caught them lying. Um, you know, have you ever caught your kids lying and you, you're like... <sighs> I know they're lying, but I don't want to deal with that right now. How many of you have done that before? Be honest. I've done that a lot, and I'm, you know, you kind of get convicted about it. I say a lot, not a lot. You don't just let them off the hook all the time. But it's something that needs to be addressed when we see it. Because we can't let our kids, we can't let ourselves think it's okay to lie and get away with it and think it's going to stop there. Mm -hmm. And so I was dealing with this, and... I'm wanting to get. I want her to get to the root of why did you lie to me? And I know you know why. You know why anyone lies? They lie for fear of what the truth, what they think the truth will get them. Right? If I tell you the truth, I'm going to get in trouble. When we've always said, no, when you lie, you're going to be in double trouble. Right? And and she she wouldn't say it. She wouldn't get there. And I'm like, I, we'll just sit here all night until you get there on your own. That this is why this is why you lied, and you know I get all the answers. She's like, "Wow, why did you lie?" Because the devil told me to. Well, why are you doing what the devil told you told you to do, right? How many of you have thought? Well, the de-? and guess what? Like she's not wrong. He, the devil is the father of lies, and he is the one suggesting, "Hey, just lie about that. They'll let it go. Uh, you won't, you know, you won't get in trouble." Like she's not wrong about that. But there also has to be an accepting of responsibility. The devil cannot make you do anything. 
You have a choice to make. And you need to Amen. submit to what God says Amen. and not do what the devil is telling you to do, right? That's right. And then so we got to the, where I wanted her to get to. She said it. And then I said, what, what is going on? Why? She's like, I don't She's like, I don't know what to do when the, the devil tells me to lie. I'm like, yes, you do. It was our memory verse last week. Submit yourself to God and resist the devil, and he will run away from you, scared mm-hmm. and afraid. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So I, I just put into practice a memory verse that we're, that we're doing every week and we're talking to our kids about too. I put that into practice. This is a real thing. When you are submitted to God, you can resist the devil and he will run away from you. That's right. He will run away from your four-year-old kid. That's right. From your 10-year-old kid. That's right. If they submit them, I said, but here's what you've got to do. When those thoughts come, just tell a lie to mom and dad. You have to submit yourself to God and say, no, I, I tell the truth. Mm-hmm. We tell the truth in this house, and I'm I'm like I'm made in the image of God, and God doesn't lie. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna t- you know what that is? That's submitting yourself to God. That's right. That's doing what God says. That's right. And then guess what? Now that you're submitted to God, you can say, "Devil, you get away from me that's in Jesus' right. name," and He will run away. That's right. And that's that thought right. will go with Him. That's right. Submit Amen. yourself to God. Amen. Resist the devil, and this goes for all of us, obviously too. If you find that, man, I've been declaring God's word, I've been speaking God's word, it doesn't seem like it's working, are, are you submitted to him? That's right. Am, am I submitted, God, am I submitted to you? That's right. Or are, have we allowed ourselves to be deceived and we're believing a lie? Right. And, you know, this, it's like this chain that Pastor Nate talked about, and we're out of the chain and we don't even know why. Right. That's why we've got to look in the mirror and be honest with ourselves, right? That's right. Submit ourselves to God. Then resist the devil, Amen. and he'll flee. That's good. And I do sense that very, very strong, that that is an answer for some of us in, in this house tonight, maybe some that are watching online. But there have been some things that have been a battle and that you feel like that you've been uh, resisting and resisting and resisting. And, you know, sometimes sometimes it's not that we're not submitted to God in an area. Uh, sometimes it is that we just have to make a stand and we have to be determined not to quit. Uh, we are we are told to uh, to hold fast to our confession of faith. What does that mean? We don't let go of it, no matter what we see, no matter what we hear, no matter what circumstances is going on. We are instructed to hold fast to our confession of faith, for He who promised is faithful. And not everything happens instantaneously. Not everything manifests in our life when we say Amen. Uh, if y'all will give me just a couple of minutes, I do, I, do want to, I do want to say this. Sometimes we just quit too soon. And you say, man, I don't know what that, because I feel like I've been holding on for a really, uh, a really, really long time, holding on to a promise of God that hasn't manifested in, in my life yet. And uh, I, I'm not, I think it was Lester Summerall, but it was a, a general of faith that said, sometimes, he said, sometimes I just believe that instantaneous healings, uh, instantaneous miracles, sometimes, um, sometimes does damage <clears throat> to God's people. Why? Because they don't learn how to stand fast, to hold fast, to the, promise of, to the promises of God in the face of storms, in the face of, uh, uh, of just trials, right? And we know that the enemy, well, all he's after is the Word. All he's after is the Word in your life. All he's after is the Word of God in your life. And he said, how much pressure is it going to take to just um, cause them to let go of it and give up? And so sometimes we just give up too soon. And we need to take ourselves out of this arena and out of this realm where we're thinking about time. Well, it's been 
it's been three months. Well, it, it, it's been two years. It's, we get ourselves all messed up when we think about time when we're holding fast to our confession of faith. Amen. Amen. So, so sometimes, sometimes we've just got to hold fast. And we've got to have that bulldog determination that I'm not moving off of this. Like Smith Wigglesworth said, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm only moved by what I believe, and I believe God. Faithful is he who promised, and this shall come to pass in my life. Amen. So this is fighting the good fight of faith. And you know, when we're holding fast, we've got to, I'm spitting, I'm sorry. We've got to do some resisting because the enemy of our souls is after that word. So we have to do some resisting dur during this time period. And if I'm not submitted to God, if, I, if, I, if God is dealing with me about something, either about my attitude or, or he's instructed me to do this or he's instructed me to do that and I'm not submitted to that, then my authority isn't working because I'm not submitted to Him, right? Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Hallelujah. You want to pray? Y'all stand up. Did you get anything out of the Word tonight? Amen. Always. Thank you, Lord. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your Word. We thank you that uh, your Word does the work. And we know that because your word was sown tonight uh, and our hearts were open and ready to receive, it's planted and it's going to produce that harvest in our life. So we thank you for it. We apply the blood of Jesus over it and we expect a harvest in our life of this word. Thank Father, thank you, you for the Holy Spirit who's our teacher, our guide, our helper. He is everything that we need. And as it comes to this word, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would help us exercise it every single day exercise it every opportunity that we get yes every opportunity we get thank you. we thank you for it we thank you for your grace to do your word and to obey your word we are doers of the word and not hearers only yes that's what i declare over every person in here they are a doer of the word they're not a hearer only we are doers of the word of god hallelujah so lord we thank, thank you, you lord. for these doers doing your word and your word doing the work. Hallelujah. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, you, amen.